Check. Check one, two. Test one, two. Checking. Checking, checking and testing. Check. Testing, testing. testing. Got to keep that COVID off. Test one, two. Check, check, check. Check. Check one, two. Test. I don't hear feedback like I felt like I had last time. Oh. Uh, mute, mute John real quick, just to make sure. Oh. It's coming through here. Okay, cool. Test, test, test. Sounds good. All right. I'll try not to yell too loud.
Welcome to uh, Mosaic Boston JP. My name is John. I'm the worship leader here. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, we're going to get started uh, with the worship here. Um, so would you please uh, stand up and sing with us? There's no deed that can redeem us There's no right nor magic word Only by the works of Jesus Can salvation be secured It is finished, He has done it Let your weary heart rejoice our redemption is accomplished. Raise a shout and rag of force. And go bravely into battle, knowing he has won the world. It is finished, let your and weep no There's no sacrifice to offer, there's no penance to complete. Freely drink of living water, without money come in feast. It is finished, he has done it, let your weary heart rejoice. Our redemption is accomplished. Our agonize and go bravely into battle, knowing we as one will. And it's finished, lift your left, we sing the rejoice, hear the dying victor's cry, raise up your voice, sing. Out through earth and sky, it is finished. He has done it. Let your weary heart rejoice. Our redemption is accomplished. Raise a shout with a your voice and go bravely into battle, knowing we as one. It's finished, lift it, and weep no more. sought you as his people remember he has saved you from your sin remember remember him remember Jesus brought you through the Red Sea Mighty miracles that you've seen. Remember, you were slaves and now are free. Remember the he is king. Sing it out. To the only God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The glory, honor, power, and dominion Before all time and now and evermore Remember, 
Jesus raised above the heavens He's coming He is coming with His kingdom Do not forget He is seated on the throne Remember what He has done But to the only God Our Savior in Jesus Christ The glory on the power and dominion Before all time And now and evermore Before all time Now and forever For Now we're going to go over to Ali and Minimo. You may be seated. Play six tokens with their spaces, get nine cards, three decks, characters. Oh, this is so confusing. Hi, it's Miss Ali. Welcome to Minimo Online. You know, I'm trying to read the directions for this board game that I want to play, but they are super, super confusing. You know what? We just learned about Noah last week, and after Noah, lots and lots of people were born, and lots and lots of people were on the earth again, but you know what? Everyone spoke the same language. They could all understand each other, and so one day they got together, and they said, you know what? Let's build a beautiful city where we can be safe. That sounds good. I like that. Safe city, and you know what they also said? Let's build a big, giant tower for ourselves so we can look awesome and that everyone can look down on us and then we could be like God making our way up to heaven. That does not sound so good. See, we always try to do things on our own without God and God knew that that was not going to be a good idea. So you know what he did? One day when they got up to finish their big giant tower, they all spoke different languages. No one understood each other, and they couldn't finish their tower, so they just kind of gave up. And they scattered throughout the whole earth, and they separated and went different ways. So I'm going to invite my friend up, John. Come on, John. Come on, man. This is John. Hi. So he is going to tell me what to draw on my board. Okay, I'm ready. Tell me, what should I draw? Desenho um avião. Uh, can, can, you, can you say that one more time for me? Desenha um avião. Okay. Um, yeah? No? No. What color? What color is it? What color is it? Roxo. Oh. Oh, that's blue, obviously. That's obviously blue. We're going to put right here, a little something right here. That's definitely what he... Uh, that's, not, that's not it, is it? No. Uh, oh, 
John, go away. Go away. <sighs> that was so confusing. I have no idea what he told me to draw, and I still actually don't have any idea what he told me to draw. See, God knew that there was no way to get to heaven without him. You can try all you want. You can build a tower. It doesn't matter. A tower doesn't get you to heaven. A person does. Jesus. And God had to send his son Jesus to earth to live a perfect life so we could come and be friends with God. And that's what God knew. So next time you try to do something on your own, just know that God is there to help you, and he's for you, and he sent his son to help you. I hope you guys have a great week. Thanks, John, for confusing me with a picture of swirlies that I made. I hope that's what he said. I'm pretty sure it's not. Hope you guys have a great week. I'll see you next week. Bye! All right. Well, thank you, Miss Allie, for that. Uh, always love that. And we love our kids, which is why it's so great to have my kids and other kids in the service today. Uh, it is something that I think is very much a part of the church culture, and, and as of recently, we've changed that. So uh, I'm glad that we have a chance to get a, a lesson that is uh, for the kids, and uh, we are glad that they can have something. So we're going to be in Jonah if you want to, and you have a, a, a copy of the scriptures, excuse me. Uh, you can open up to Jonah chapter 4, and that's where we're going to be. I'll give you a few minutes to find it. It's kind of a hard verse or a hard chapter to find. Um, and so we're going to be in Jonah 4 all day today. Now, I'm going to show you guys a secret that you cannot tell anybody, all right? So uh, it stays in this room, and uh, no one can see this. Uh, I got these pictures to show you here. So today's sermon is called The Roast of Jonah, Son of Amittai. Now, if these are pictures that somebody can be roasted for, you can roast me for these <laughs> pictures here. That is a scooter, a Vespa, that I spent way too much money buying around the time that Maggie was born. We needed two vehicles, and I thought, why not get a Vespa? And so you may be asking, why would I get a scooter, a moped, as my second mode of transportation? Well, first off, if you've ever watched the TV show Scrubs, uh, you'll know why. Um, he rides a scooter in that show, and I was really into it at the time. Also, massive fan of the band MXPX, and they have a line in one of my favorite songs that talks about riding a Vespa. And so I said to myself, I'm going to get a Vespa the minute I can, and needing a second vehicle was the perfect excuse to do it. And as you can see here, I am a huge dork uh, in, in these pictures, and and, you know, I'm kind of playing it up there. And, uh, but, yeah, let's just keep this between us. Don't ever show these pictures to anybody. Um, so if you see there, where I'm in a parking lot. That is our old apartment complex. What happened here is that parking lot, soon after I got my scooter, was repaved. And um, if you know anything about repaving with asphalt, it can get a little tricky. So I had got my scooter, and I had parked it. Well, one day I went out to go to work, and I go to hop on my scooter, and the scooter has fallen over which when a motorcycle, or technically it is a motorcycle by the way, it was 150 cc's just so you know. Um, when, a, when a motorcycle falls over, it reduces you know, the value of it and all these kinds of things. You have to tell people it fell over. And so I was just really, really upset. And it had scratches on the side when I picked it up. It was really distressing. And so the car that was parked next to it, the one that I assumed hit it, was the apartment manager's car. So I immediately got up, I mean, I was just floored. I was furious. I walked in to the office of the apartment manager, and I went in there, and I just started yelling like crazy at him about knocking over my scooter. I went full Karen on this guy. Um, and, you know, he really didn't deserve it. And he says, you know what? I said, is your car out there? You knocked over my scooter. He says, you know what? I didn't touch your scooter. It was already knocked over when I got out there. And I said, well, somebody knocked over my scooter, and I ran out the door. It's not my finest moment. I will confess it was not my finest moment. I get out there, and it's going to get worse, believe me. Get out there to find out that the scooter had the, uh, a kickstand, and the new asphalt had melted under the hot sun, and the kickstand had fallen, and the scooter had fallen over on its own. And so essentially, I was the one that broke my own scooter, hurt my own scooter, scratched up my own scooter, and knocked it over. This scooter that I had paid way too much money for. He had nothing to do with it, and from that time forward, my relationship with my apartment manager was on rocky ground. Um, I was unable to be 
he knew I was a pastor, probably from that moment forward, unable to be a good witness to him. Um, and we really didn't probably have any opportunities to do any kind of ministry inside the apartment complex from that time forward because of the way I treated him. See, I told myself a story about what was most important. And to me, the most important thing was having nice things. It was having something really nice. And I didn't think I could replace that scooter. And I had placed so much importance on this stupid scooter, this stupid Vespa scooter, that the, the person in front of me, the image bearer in front of me, meant nothing. And I went in there and let him have it. We've all told ourselves a meta story of sorts. So we all have what is called a worldview, the way we see the world. And that worldview tells us what is most important. And for Christians, it's in the name. Our worldview should tell us that Christ is more important. And if all of us are honest, we're, we'll confess, like, Christ is not always most important, but it should be what we strive for. And so... The problem is, though, is that we make other things more valuable. Sometimes we say our worldview tells us to make safety the most important thing. And, and we should be relatively safe people. We should care for others. These are things we should do. But when we make safety the most important, it can become a problem. Other, others of us, uh, we tell ourselves a world, uh, uh, we have a worldview, tell ourselves a story where politics is the most important thing in all of life. And nothing else touches politics. Everything else lines up underneath our politics, or maybe it's culture. There's a t particular culture that you, um, you identify with or, or like or enjoy, and you tell you that yourself that story. For some, it's prosperity, and maybe that's where mine landed. It's things, items that we have, and living in a nice home, and making the most money, and getting all the things in life that we want. We've told ourselves a story of what's most important. And Jonah, today in Jonah chapter 4, is no different. He had told himself a story about the things that were most important. What he found is that it contradicted the story that God was telling. See, God was telling a story about, God was writing a story about his love to the world. It started with Abraham in the very beginning. He told Abraham, I am going to make, a, I'm going to make you a people. I'm going to make you a family. And through that family, the entire world will be blessed. The whole world. But Jonah had told himself a story where God's people, the Jewish people, were the most important, the most worthy. They were superior over anyone else. They were more loved, and God only cared about them. And so, today, we see God roast Jonah. And you guys know what a roast is, right? Have you ever seen a roast where people get up there and they insult another person? It's usually pretty hilarious, probably uh, not very, not a great thing for a Christian to be watching, but anyway, but we've seen it. Well, God is going to do a godly roast today on Jonah. So to catch up on the story of Jonah, if you don't know it, the way it starts is Jonah is a prophet. He is, he is a prophet for the people of Israel. His hometown is in Samaria. God comes to him in the middle of that, and he says, I want you to deliver a message to Nineveh. Nineveh was the uh, enemies of Israel, and Jonah says, not going to happen, God. So he goes in the opposite direction across the entire world as far away from, as possible from where God wanted him to be, to a place called Tarshish. And on the way there, God interrupts him with a storm, and everybody on the boat thinks they're going to die. And the sailors, this whole thing, they figure out that Jonah's the reason that they're all going to die. So they end up throwing him overboard. Jonah's like, I just want to die. He starts to sink, and then he starts to have second thoughts about dying. And in the middle of that, he repents, and he prays out to God. Writes this beautiful Hebrew poetry, if you've ever gone and read it. Writes this poetry. We read it a few weeks ago. And um, he says, God, I don't want to die. Save me, save me. And God sends a fish to grab him. That's probably this part of the story of Jonah that you know the best. The fish gets him. He stays in the belly of the fish for three days, and then he gets vomited out on land. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches a five-word sermon in Hebrew. All of Nineveh, 120,000 people, come to follow Yahweh, repent, and that is where our story starts today. Now you can think, if you, if you know anything about a steel bar, I know some of you guys are engineers, so you're going to understand this way better than me. This is just from my experience of seeing these kinds of things. And if you want to correct me, I'll probably oversimplify. You can correct me after. But a steel bar has uh, what I think is elasticity, where it can bend a certain amount and then go back to its original shape. Um, but if you bend it far enough, it will eventually break, right? So 
What happened with the heart of Jonah in this moment, in the fish, when he repents and he says, God, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to do what you say, it's, it's as if God has bent his heart. But the second he gets into an opportunity where he can again go against God, his heart pops back into place. Because his heart had never been broken. This is something that I see often in church. Um, I'll, I'll get up here and speak, and we'll have people make decisions, and they'll do, you know, do the digital card, and they'll say, I want to follow Christ, I want to get baptized, they'll be online or whatever. They'll do all these things, and it's as if during a moment their hearts are bent by God, but they have not yet been broken. And so when the moment passes, when the emotion passes, that bar kind of straightens out, uh, their heart straightens out back to where it was. And Jonah here was bent, but not broken. And listen to what he says in chapter 4. Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled to Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today as we look into chapter 4 of Jonah, I pray that you would use this passage to impact us, God. That you would break our hearts for what breaks yours. That as we leave this room and as we listen to your word today, that our hearts wouldn't just be bent to the, go back to the shape they were when we walked in, but God, we would be broken for you. God, use this passage to your glory. Speak through my words. May they be your words. Work deeply in all of our hearts and start with mine today. Lord, when you speak today, may I obey. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jonah, he says, it says that he is displeased and became furious. Literally in Hebrew, this is, it was exceedingly evil to Jonah. So uh, the NIV kind of picks up on it when it says, but to Jonah this seemed very wrong, and he became angry with God. The Jonah was standing in judgment of God and saying that, God, you don't know what you're doing. You don't understand. God, you are evil. What you have done with Nineveh is evil, letting them live. And he became very angry. Jonah 4, 2 says, I knew that you were gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, one who relents from sending disaster. I knew this about you. I knew that if I brought this message of hope, if I brought this message of repentance to the people of Nineveh, that they were going to turn from their ways and you were going to relent. And that's what I didn't want you to do. And that's why I didn't want to come in the first place. And that's why I went to Tarshish, because I hate these people. I don't want them to die. But that's who you are. I knew it. Jonah here is quoting a famous Jewish refrain from Exodus. If you know the story of when Moses gives the Ten Commandments, he comes down off the mountain and the people have started this uh, party at the bottom of the mountain and they made a golden calf. And they look at the golden calf, they set it up and say, they say, this golden calf is Yahweh who brought you out of Egypt. Worship it. And Moses comes down and he is losing his mind that the people have done this just at the moment that God has made them, his, uh, God has made them his people, they go back on God. And Jonah, I mean, and, and Moses, then the Lord says, I'm going to destroy these people. I'm going to get rid of them. I'm going to start a new people with you, Moses, and these people are all going to die today. And Moses says, don't do it, Lord. He says, don't, um, don't kill them. And so the Lord says, okay, because you've asked Moses, I will relent. And this is what Moses says to God after he relents from killing his own people. He says, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to, the, to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Jonah is questioning God not on what he misunderstands about God, but on what he understands about God, who he knows he is. And this is blasphemous. Sometimes we can have disagreements about the way 
God maybe acts because we misunderstand who he is. But there are so many times, particularly in our modern culture, where God, the God we read in the scriptures goes against our modern sensibilities. And we say, God, you are evil for doing this thing or thinking this way. How could you let this happen? This is evil. And if we think that it goes against our modern sensibilities, Jonah and his ancient sensibility says, same. <laughs> Jonah's ancient sensibility said, God, for acting the way you have, you are evil. You should have taken these people out. And in verse 3, this is what he says. Jonah verse 4, verse 3, he says, And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. In other words, God, you are so evil that if this is the God that I'm serving, I would rather be dead than serve you. Man, Jonah's mad. <laughs> this is the same guy that just a few verses ago was asking God to save him, and now he's by all sense, all sense, cussing God out here. See, God is evil to Jonah. He would rather die than live with a God that would save a place like Nineveh. And I love, this is the first roast. I love what God comes and says to him. Roast number one, who do you think you are? Listen, listen to what he says exactly. Verse four, and the Lord asks, is it right for you to be angry? In other words, who do you you think you are. During the summer, we bring the kids out to the pool, and we'll go to maybe like a water park or something. Um, I'm just thankful this summer some of the pools are actually open. When you go to the pool, you'll have like a 15-year-old lifeguard there. And I'll be playing with my kids, having fun, you know, not doing anything too crazy, just having a lot of fun. And all of a sudden I hear, I hear the whistle go off, and this snot-nosed 15-year-old is telling me, a 35-year-old man, what I shouldn't do in the pool with my own kids. And I want to look at him and go, who do you think you are? Now, when I sign a little release waiver and get in, come in, I, I uh, say I'm going to follow the rules, even when the 15-year-old tells me not to do it. But could you imagine if the owner of the entire um, park comes in and he says, he says, uh, the 15-year-old blows the whistle at the owner. He's playing with his kid. The owner could look at him and say, who do you think you are? I made these rules. These are my rules. You won't tell me what to do. And here God has every right to look at Jonah and say, you don't even understand. Who do you think you are? This is a pretty ro common roast for God. We see him do it with Moses, a uh, different part of the scriptures. At the burning bush, Moses is like, I can't do it. And God gives him every reason he can. At the very end, he says, who do you think you are, Moses? We see him doing it with the prophet Jeremiah, where Jeremiah doesn't um, trust God. And God comes to him and says, who do you think you are? But particularly in Job, I love this passage in Job. Job comes up against God and he says, God, you, how could you let this happen? I have been righteous. I have done everything you've ever asked me to do. I have followed you in every way. How could you hurt me? How could you do this? How could you do this in my life? And this is what God says to Jonah, I mean, excuse me, to Job, excuse me. He says, who is this who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? Get ready to answer me like a man when I question you. You will inform me. Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who do you think you are? And then God goes through three chapters of telling Job every reason that he is insignificant, how great and magnificent and all-knowing and all-powerful and all-understanding God is. And Job, after listening to this three-chapter tirade by God, says this. This is what he says. You asked... Who is this who counsels my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I did not understand. Things too wondrous for me to know. In other words, God, I questioned you. You did not deserve to be questioned. You understand all. 1 Corinthians 1.25 reminds us of this. When we start to think that God is out of line with our modern sensibilities, and maybe he is, but when we start to think that we have it all figured out, 1 Corinthians reminds us of this. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. In other words, the things that we think are foolish, the things that we think are strong, God comes along and we think God is foolish. We think God is uh, weak about these things, and he says, no, my foolishness and my strength are way stronger than yours could ever be. So who are we to stand in judgment of God? Just imagine, in my, in my 35 years, there's a lot of things I kind of feel like I have figured out. 
And I know if you're watching this and you're like 35, so young, you're here in the room, so young, whatever, how could you have things figured out? I say to you, exactly. To think, how could we question a God that has been around eternally, that knows and designed this, this universe as he did? Who do you think you are? That's what I say. If you're in a moment in your life, and I know a lot of us are at times in our lives right now where we don't quite understand what's going on. There's a lot of struggles. Maybe we've had people that we love that have been hurt. Um, we've lost a job, whatever. We don't understand what God's doing, what he's, what he's, uh, how he's working. But I can say this to you. If you knew everything that God knew, you'd understand perfectly what he was doing. If you knew everything that God knew, you would understand perfectly what he was doing. And that's called trust. When we talk about trust and we talk about leaning on God, that is what it is. It's saying, you know what, God, I don't see the whole picture, but I know you do. And even though I'm going through this thing right now, even though this is maybe the worst time of my life, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you in the midst of it. But the roast isn't over for Jonah yet. Verse 5. Jonah left the city and found a place east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. What I love about this is Jonah goes out to the city and he just wants to watch it. It's like a movie to him. He's hoping that like Sodom and Gomorrah happen. Fireballs will fall out of the sky. Lightning will strike Nineveh. Nineveh will be destroyed. God would not have truly listened. They will fall back on their repentance and God would destroy them. He's just hoping and praying that this will happen. But let's go on. Verse 6. Then the Lord God appointed a plant. And it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. His, Jonah's little bald head was getting sunburned, so God provides him shade. Very nice of God. God keeps caring for Jonah. You notice that? And Jonah was greatly displeased with the plant. I mean, excuse me, he was greatly pleased with the plant. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's bald little head, so much so, I added the little, sorry, so much so that he almost fainted, and he wanted to die, and he said, it is better for me to die than live. Man, Jonah is such a drama prophet, right? He just is all, I just, I want to die. He sounds like a 15-year-old or something. I don't know what I have against 15-year-olds today, but anyway. Um, uh, emo kid or something. So he just always wants to die here. And God sends this scorching wind. Um, uh, this was probably is called like a, a Sor Sirocco wind. It comes in at about 60 miles an hour. It's full of sand. It's hot. Temperature rises by about 20 degrees just in a matter of minutes. It can bring the temperatures in Mesopotamia up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. If you uh, are, uh, you know, a metric person, that's 43 degrees Celsius. And it literally roasted Jonah. So that's the second roast of God. Yes, this entire sermon was a bit of a dad joke uh, because God literally roasts Jonah in the sun. Sorry about that. I can't help it. It's, I got five kids. What do you want me to do? All right. So this is what goes on, verse 9. Then God asked Jonah, it is right for you to be angry. Is it right for you to be angry about this plant? And Jonah says, yes, it's right, he replied. I'm angry enough to die. <laughs> so the Lord said, you cared about this plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. But may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left hand, as well as many animals. Don't forget about the cows. Cows keep coming up in this story. That's literally in Hebrew, as well as many cows. Um, this idea of right and left hand means they can't tell right from wrong, and God cares about them. He comes to him and says, this second rose, you better be glad that I love my enemies, Jonah, because if I didn't love my enemies, you would be worse than dead. Jonah keeps wanting to die here, and God's saying, no, you got to understand, Jonah, that if I didn't love my enemies, that at the bottom of Mount Sinai, when uh, Moses came and begged me not to kill your people, you wouldn't even exist because I would have destroyed them at that point. But I am a God that is slow to anger. I am a God that is gracious. I am a God that is merciful and wanting people to come to repentance. And that is why you and your people that you love so much even exist today. 
Jonah, do you remember when you were in that fish and you were at the bottom of the sea and, and, and you wanted to be saved by me? You remember that moment, Jonah? That moment where you prayed out to me and though you had gone against everything I asked you to do, I came and I saved you from the depths of the sea. Do you remember that moment, Jonah? I'm a God that is gracious and merciful and slow to anger. Remember that. Because Jonah... I love my enemies because you were and are my enemy. This is what Jonah is not getting at this point, is that he is Nineveh. He has been Nineveh. And the only reason that he is here is because of this aspect of God's character. That God is gracious and merciful and compassionate and slow to anger. And this is the kicker. For all of us, is that we, me and you, we are Nineveh. That all of us at a point were enemies of God. Romans 5.10 tells us this. It says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. That at one point, we were all enemies of God. We were all Nineveh. We were all destined for destruction. We were heading that way. If we're a follower of Christ, Christ has come in. He has saved us, and we have gone from enemies to friends in God's eyes. Why did he save us, an enemy of his? Because God loves his enemies. It is a part of his character. And this is the part that we have a hard time adjusting to, I think. The part that's just like Jonah that the grace that has been shown to us when we were God's enemies is the same grace that God shows to our enemies. This book hurts so much, I think, me, when I read through it. Because I realize that not only am I Nineveh, but far too often I am also Jonah. Who being like Nineveh, an enemy of God, once I get a friendship status, all of a sudden is the one that determines who can be right with God. Oh, you know, that group over there, they can't, they can't have a relationship with God. That group right there needs to be punished. This is what needs to happen to them. I become like Jonah. Thomas Carlyle wrote a book, a book of poetry about the, uh, the, the book of Jonah. And I love this little poem he writes about this moment in the story. He says, And Jonah stalked to his shaded seat and waited for God to come around to his way of thinking. And God is still waiting for a host of Jonas in their comfortable houses to come around to his way of loving. That there are people that we, like Jonah, say God's grace is not for them. It's for me, but it's not for them. We see that those that have experienced the grace of God are those that should be filled with the most grace and should be those that are most compassionate, those that are giving of mercy to others. We, if you're a follower of Christ today, should be the first to show compassion to the world. A quote from a pastor in Raleigh, Durham, named J.D. Greer. He says this, A spirit of unforgiveness and a lack of generosity is the indication that you are out of touch with the grace of God in your own life. Let me read that one more time. A spirit of unforgiveness and a lack of generosity is the indication you are out of touch with the grace of God in your own life. If you are not willing to forgive someone who has hurt you, someone that is your enemy, if you are not willing to be generous and compassionate with God, what God has given you, it shows that you don't truly understand the grace that has been given to you by God. God, that those that understand the grace of God are those that are anxious and waiting and willing and hoping to give it away to others and say, I forgive you. All of us probably at some point in our life or maybe right now have enemies in our life. Maybe it's a personal enemy. Maybe it's somebody you just don't like as a human being. You're just, I, I hate them. I hate them. I don't want to see them. I don't like their voice. I don't like the way they smell, the way they look, the kind of clothes they wear. I just hate that person. Maybe you can't put your finger on quite why that is, but you just don't like them. Might be somebody at work, might be somebody at school, whatever it is, you don't love them. Others of you have a personal enemy who's someone that has actually caused you true pain and harm and trauma 
in your life, someone that you, as you think about them, you remember things that they did to you that you can't get over and you think, I can never forgive that person. That's real. Never to minimize any of that, but to say, as we think about who our enemies are in life and who should be forgiven, we need to remember all that. Also, maybe we have philosophical enemies, people that see the world differently from us. They have a different worldview. They've told themselves a different story. And sometimes we can say, my story is superior. And because your story isn't, I'm not going to pay you any respect. I'm not going to show you any love or care. And you can just go to hell. They stand in our way. Maybe we need to get past them. Other people are people that are a different type of people group. Maybe it's a cultural or ethnic group or a racial group. Someone that has um, a different skin color or a different culture than us. And we can tend to demonize them. We can say, well, because the way that their, their culture and the way they've lived and they've grown up, the things they do I think are wrong. And I've grown up this way and I know that if those things become a part of culture, then my culture is not going to be accepted. And we can begin to demonize and hate the other. Perhaps it's political, and maybe this is the most poignant of all the points today. Their enemies can be political. Things are cranking up politically um, every day. And both sides, both red and blue, think the other is evil. And there is no doubt that in every election, there are people that are better choices than others. And that's a decision that you have to make, and you have to have that decision be informed by the scriptures, what I encourage. And I'm not saying that there isn't that. But what happens is both sides point at each other and talk about how evil and wicked the other side is. And if you don't know that both sides are saying it to each other, you probably need to expand who you talk to and who you hear from because both sides say it. Become, uh, we make enemies, political enemies. And this is the scandal of grace. We sing that song often. The scandal of grace is even those enemies in our life, personal, philosophical, uh, cultural, racial, or political, or whatever, if you can think of more, even those enemies in our life are those that God desires to have come to repentance and follow him, that he wants to follow him. That's the scandal of grace, even if we hate them. Like Jonah hated Nineveh, God comes to us and says, I love them, and because I love them, you should love them. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any, not wanting any, not even your enemies, not even my enemies, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Every single one he desires for them to come to repentance. And this is what Jesus says about our enemies in Matthew 5.43-45. He says, You've heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. I want you to love and care and have compassion and pray for those who are coming after you, who want to destroy you, have different philosophical and political views from you. Those that want to destroy you, pray and love them so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. In other words, a core sign of what a follower of Christ is is that a follower of Christ is going to love those that are hard to love that is going to want to have compassion on those that are hard to have compassion on. It is a core sign of who we are, the children of our Father in heaven. We must love those who are our enemies, lest we fall temptation to becoming like Jonah and wanting them to die. All of us have been Nineveh. May we not become Jonah. Walter Wink, a theologian, and a minister in a book called the uh, Walter Wink Collective Readings. He talks about the gift of the enemy, that all of us have someone in our lives that are used to kind of shape and form us into who God wants us to be. And he just says it so well, I, I don't think I can say it better myself. He says, friends seldom show us our flaws. They are our friends precisely because they are able to overlook or ignore those parts of us. The enemy is therefore not just our hurdle to be leaped over on the way to God. Our enemy might actually be the way to God. We cannot come to terms with our own inner shadows except through our enemies. 
We have almost no other access to those unacceptable parts of ourselves that need redeeming except through the mirror of our, uh, that our enemies hold up to us. It's as if those that we have in our lives, philosophical, political, personal, racial, uh, ethnic, those enemies that we have in our lives, God uses them to kind of pull at us and strings come out and we see the strings that need to be fixed and what needs to be changed. They, they bring out the worst parts in us and that's what God says, that is the part of you that I want to change. And God uses our enemies in that way. Is it possible that God has given you, your enemy, today, whether it be a person or an idea, that he wants to use in your life to shape and form you into who you need to be? So I'm going to challenge you with uh, something really practical this week. I don't always give, me, give something this practical, this concrete, but I'm going to challenge you with it today. I'm going to ask you that if you would think about who you think in your life you just don't love, that you just don't care for. Maybe they're your enemy. Maybe you've never thought of it that way before, but maybe you need to come to grips with that. You've thought of them, you've, you've put them in that place in your life. They've taken up that place in your life. I want you to create a prayer list of those people, those persons, and then I want you to pray for them every single day this week. And let God work in your heart that you could have his heart, know his way, understand his compassion, and those that, are the, that you think are the most against you, you could care for. If you think that's impossible, I'm going to read to you the story of Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom is from the Netherlands. She came from a watchmaker's family, devout Christian family. Um, during World War II, they hid Jewish people in their home. They had made a room, a secret room, and the Nazis couldn't find the Jewish people, but they knew that they were in there. And so what they did is they camped outside the house and tried to starve the Jewish people out, that they were hiding in the home, uh, but they, actually the Jewish people ended up escaping, which was a huge blessing. But in the midst of that, Corey, her father, and her sister got brought to a Nazi concentration camp. Corey ends up escaping through a clerical error. Her sister dies. Her father dies in the concentration camp. And just, just weeks after she ends up escaping through this clerical error, um, those women that she were with were brought to the gas chambers to be killed. And so by God's grace and God's um, uh, working in her life and um, sovereignty, she did not die. And this is what she writes in her book. She says, It was in a church in Munich that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat. A brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door in the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. This is, she's like the anti-Jonah, going to her enemies, right? The ones that had persecuted her, going to them saying, God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. After my talk, I saw him working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform, a visored cap, and a skull and crossbones. They came back with a rush. A, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking past this man naked. I could see my sister in front of me, frail, her frail form, her skin wrapped around her ribs like paper over ribs. Betsy, you were so thin, I thought. Now he was in front of me, and his hand was thrust out, and he says, a fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that you say all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so ghibli of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he said. I was a guard there. Oh, he didn't remember me. 
But since that time, he went on, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? I stood there. I, whose sins had every day to be forgiven and could not forgive his. My sister had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking for forgiveness? It seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives is a pri- has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And I still stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an, emo- not an emotion. I knew that. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. Can you supply the feeling? So I woodenly, mechanically, thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, this incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulders, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood over my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard, the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did The same God that was merciful to Jonah, merciful to Nineveh, merciful to Corey, and merciful to that Nazi guard is the same God that wants to show you mercy today. He is slow to anger and compassionate. He has not changed. If you've ever wondered if God loves you, he sent Christ as the outflow of his grace-filled heart to say anyone on the way to perishing can have life in my son. Unlike Jonah, Jesus was not just watching and waiting for us to die, but is here to bring salvation. See, Christ willingly went into hostile territory for you to redeem you. He took the blame for every wrong that you'd ever done, big and small. He went to the cross and took that punishment on your behalf, in your place. And now he says, because I've paid your penalty, you can have salvation. You can be saved. I want to give you grace. I forgive you. And he is willing to accept you with open arms and says, trust and follow me. If you've not trusted and followed him and his gracious heart today you can to say God thank you though I was an enemy I want to be your friend Jesus with open arms will accept you that's the decision you made today I want to encourage you to let someone know that you've made that decision that you've come to follow Christ and follow him with your whole heart you can either Text Mosaic to 33777. That's the way we follow up with people. Or you can come talk to me afterwards. Or you can email us uh, um, at info, uh, jp at mosaicboston.com. Any way that you can get in touch with us, please let us know what Christ has done in your heart today. You've re- received the forgiveness of Jesus today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we are grateful that we, who were once your enemies, have become your friends. We are thankful that you have given yourself for us on the cross, that you have provided a way that we could have salvation, that when we should have been destroyed, when we should have been absolutely wiped off of this planet, Lord, we know that, God, you um, gave, made a way for us through your Son. May we never forget that. May we live in that. Lord, I pray all this in Jesus' name. We're now going to go into a time of communion. If you're here and you're with us, there are some cups right underneath um, the uh, floor there. Uh, And um, 
if I could get someone to give me one, I'm sorry. Uh, this is live. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, on top is your wafer. You'll take that. If you're a follower of Christ, this is for you to remember what Christ has done. If you've not come to follow Christ, this is not going to do anything for you. It's not something magical that make, can make you a Christian. It's something that Christians do to uh, remember what Christ has done for them, as we remember the compassion that Christ had on us on the cross. And so I encourage you, to, if you're a baptized follower of Christ, that you partake this, of this with us. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Christ, as you were crushed for our transgressions, may we feel that today. And may we know the grace that you've had on us. Thank you, Jesus. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this, this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink all of it. Jesus, today we know that there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood, and so we stand grateful that you have forgiven us by, the, by your blood. That we now take what you have done for us and bring that to the world and those around us, that they can know the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace of our Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue singing in worship if you would join us. Uh, please stand up as we continue to worship. Men of sorrow, slam the car by his own betray. The sin of men in wrath of God has been on Jesus' way. Sing it out. The silent as he stuck you, the beaten mark in school, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, when your love poured out over me. And now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor. Yeah. Saint of heaven, God's own son, to purchase and redeem, and reconcile the very ones who nailed into that tree. Every voice. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, when your love poured out over me. And now my 
soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor. Sets free, oh, it's free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Where your love pour out over me. Yeah. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah. Praise and honor to. The stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah, God be praised. He's risen from the grave. Oh, that rugged cross. My salvation, when your love pour out over me, yeah. now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor to Thee, praise and honor to. Well, um, I know uh, everybody wants to see Justice up here doing this, and not me. I've just been speaking for way too long. Uh, Justice is still in his two-week quarantine after traveling. He will be back with us next week, so he'll be back to give you your announcements next week, God willing. Uh, just a couple of announcements for you today. First off, if you want to respond in any way to the message, if uh, you want to get connected to the church, you're either in the room or online, you can text MOSAIC to 33777. That is the official way that we connect. So I encourage you to do that, uh, to stay in touch with us. Um, also, if you would like to give online, um, we believe in being generous here and uh, want to give to the mission of the church so the church could continue to do what we're doing and God will work through his church. You can give online through uh, our website at uh, jp.mosaicboston.com slash give. And with that, that is all the announcements that we have today. I can just say get in community group. If you aren't in a community group, please talk to somebody about getting you into a community group. It is um, the lifeblood of this church and how we've even stayed going during coronavirus. So I encourage you to get involved in that. Again, that phone number I gave out earlier is the best way to get connected if you aren't already connected to a community group. With that, let's sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.
Let me end with this benediction here. Peace to the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have a wonderful week. See you next week. God bless.